Thanks for making your way back to the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. This is just the worst podcast. Episode number six here is upon you. I'm your host, Billy Donnelly, who you can find over at thisisinfamous.com as well as joeblow.com. And here, of course, at Just the Worst Podcast, where week in and week out, we talk about all the big events, happening, endeavors, uh, and goings on in the movie industry and Hollywood and uh, analyze them, break them down, put them into context and kind of speak truth to power uh, or, or something of that nature uh, so that you know what is going on, you're informed and uh, you kind of get a, a maybe a fresh or different perspective on uh, on how everything is shaping up and, and perhaps just in, in, uh, inform your discussion, inform what you're thinking, inform the debates that you have in your own personal time, uh, that that's that's what I'm here for uh, on on a weekly basis. So a uh, big week as usual. When is it not a big week? Have, has it, has there ever been a time where I've been like, nah, nothing happened this week. This week, tons happened, which is, seems to be the standard. But really, this week, uh, this week was very franchise heavy. Um, and uh, just just a lot of things to discuss, a lot of things to get into. So I'm not going to waste too much time. Let's just dive right in, especially given the fact that this was the week we got the brand new and final trailer and poster for Star Wars The Force Awakens. I know, we're like... We're less than 60 days from release date. Under two months before episode seven is finally here. Before once again we are thrown right back into the Star Wars galaxy. Continuing on with the core saga. Finding out about the Solos. Finding out about the Skywalkers. Finding about about the First Order and the Resistance and everything that's going on as a continuation of where things left off in Return of the Jedi. What's going on in this universe? What's going on with these characters? What's going on with new characters? How has this world grown and expanded beyond where we left it in the celebratory hands of Ewoks? It's okay to get excited. Look, I'm excited too. I have expectations, though, that are being managed. I've been here before. I've been in a position where new Star Wars was finally coming. And I got super excited about it. I remember being in college and talking my friend into blowing off class so that we can go see a screening of The Water Boy. That's right, Adam Sandler's The Water Boy, which we had already seen simply for the fact that that was going to be the first theatrical screening of the teaser trailer for Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. <clears throat> on the front side and the back side of the show, of the film, we were going to get to see it. And I remember, after the first trailer was over, uh, there probably had to be, I want to say maybe like 16 people in the theater. Probably about nine of them just got up and left. And the rest of us stayed, endured the Sandler film. <laughs> what, a, what are the more... One of the dumber but also entertaining Sandler films. Sat through the credits so we could watch it on the other end. So I've been a part of the hype. I've been part of the hype machine. I've been part of the ridiculous excitement about how amazing this thing has to be. And here for Star Wars The Force Awakens, I have gone completely in the opposite direction. Trying to know as little as possible. Trying to see... As few things as possible. 
trying to be able to go into December as fresh and untainted and untarnished and unknowing as possible in the hopes that having minimal expectations might, might somehow then work in my favor. Because knowing too much, I think, that's when you start to get in your head about, oh my God, this has to be amazing. This has to be excellent. This has to be great. There's no other way. It looks incredible. So it has to be incredible. Even though that's typically not how a lot of this works. We see good, amazing trailers all the time. And then go into the finished film and go, nah, it wasn't so good. The trailer's meant to sell you on going to see the film. It's meant to put your ass in a seat as a ticket buyer. So to be convinced by a trailer that something has to be good, or to be convinced right now that something has to be amazing simply because it has the Star Wars name on it, is foolish. And anyone who's old enough to have lived through the prequels should know better. That doesn't mean you can't get excited. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be enthusiastic. But within reason. Don't place labels on a film you haven't seen yet. Until you actually get to see it. You just can't do that. You gotta see the thing first and then judge, not go in saying, well, I just know I'm gonna love it. I just know, I just know. You don't just know, and everything that you always said you just knew about, typically they wind up not to live up to the, the lofty bar you have set for them. It just is. So going into December, all I've been sitting around is hoping that we're going to get a good movie. Hoping that Lucasfilm and Disney and J.J. Abrams have somehow delivered on just giving us a good movie. Something satisfying. Something that feels like it belongs in the world of Star Wars. Something that as a longtime fan, I can say, yeah, that connected with me. That told a good story. I like what these characters did. That was exciting. That was fun. I have a smile on my face as a result of what I have now just witnessed. And if it goes from good to great during the time that I'm watching it, or after, as I'm kind of dwelling on it or thinking about it deeper, bonus! Gravy! Right there. Icing on the cake. Cherry on top. Maybe even some sprinkles. That's all I'm really hoping for. I'm not hoping for, for greatness right out of the gate. I'm hoping for good. Like I hope all movies are. Every movie I see I hope is good. So I'm hoping for good with a side order of potential greatness. But that won't really be decided until I've had a chance to sit back and digest and let the Force Awakens run its course through my intestines. And then I can figure out what it is. So as a result now, going into this new trailer release, there was a part of me that didn't really want to see it. I mean, yes, granted, I was curious. I did want to see it. There was a part of me that was like, mm, yeah, new Star Wars. Let's take a look. But let's remember, we're also two months out right now. Two months out. So, being that I'm already going to see The Force Awakens, being that they already have sold me, being that I'm going to be in a theater that opening weekend to check this thing out, I don't know that I really wanted any potential new exposure to, to something that I was hoping to witness 
on the big screen for the first time in my initial viewing. I want some of that magic back, baby. I mean, is that, I, I don't think that's too hard to ask for. Too often right now, what we want continuously and consistently is the, the, the thing right away. We need to have the thing right. I need the thing right away. This thing is so cool. I need to have it right away. I need to know as much about it as I possibly can right now, far before it's ready. It's like eating a cake. Before the cake is actually made. It's like eating a cake when the cake is just batter. Just batter. Just eat the batter. And just be and be like, oh, I, I, I couldn't wait for the cake. I needed to have the cake now. I couldn't wait for the cake to actually uh, be cooked. I had to wait. I couldn't wait. I needed the cake now. So I just ate a bowl of batter. That's foolish. Sometimes it's okay. Wait for the thing to be ready. Wait for the thing to be set up, to be hand delivered to you. And then consume it when it's ready. That's why we have these issues where people are trying to track down spoilers as best they can. Or just just diving way too much into things or pouring over all these details or speculating or theorizing or trying to write their own version so that then when we get to the final product and it's not exactly the way you envisioned it, you feel a little bit disappointed. That's no way to go through life. It's horrible. So I wasn't going to watch the trailer. I, had, I decided I'm just not going to watch it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it go. I'm going to let it pass. Everybody else who wants to watch it can watch it. I'm not going to watch it. I'm going to wait. I'm going to try to stay away from this thing. And when December comes, I'm just going to sit in my seat and just let it all wash over me. Just, just let it all come to me. Just for once... Go back to that feeling of having wonder and awe and imagination and just kind of being amazed by something being projected up on the big screen and, 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 and not really knowing where it's going. Just letting it come to me rather than me chase after it. And I didn't watch the trailer. The trailer got released Monday night, halftime of the Eagles Giants Monday night football game. And I didn't watch it. And I was perfectly fine. I was okay with it. Didn't really even care. Didn't feel like I was missing anything out, missing out on anything. Didn't feel like I was out of the loop. Didn't feel at all as if. A part of me just wasn't connected to Star Wars. Felt completely at peace with my decision to not see this thing at this moment in time. Went to bed, hadn't watched it, perfectly fine. Woke up the next morning, still hadn't watched it, perfectly fine. And then what happened was social media started to creep in. And what was happening was I was being bombarded with stills and imagery from the trailer that I was hoping not to watch. Whether it was people posting up images on their Twitter timelines or on their Facebook feeds. It didn't matter that I didn't want to see it or that I was hoping not to watch it. I was successful in not watching it. It was just that then it felt as if I was watching it through still photography and others circulating it. And that's no fault to anybody else. 
It's Star Wars, man. I get it. People want to disseminate that information. They want to get it out there. They want to talk about it. They want to discuss. They want to be excited. But as somebody who's trying to stay at arm's length from it a little bit, who's trying to preserve some of the mystery, who's trying to walk into December knowing as little as possible, the world we live in makes it extremely difficult to be able to successfully do that. I was successful not being able to watch and in, in not watching it and choosing not to watch it and not having the trailer forced in front of me. But by that same token, I could not avoid the imagery anyway. So it was like I was watching it without even watching it. So in the middle of the afternoon on Tuesday, I rounded up my kids who, who have now really gotten into Star Wars. And I said, you know what? Let me show it to them. I'm going to watch it with them. Because I'm going to take them to see The Force Awakens in December. I want to be in the position to share this entirely new Star Wars experience with a new generation of people who will be able to have Star Wars for themselves now as well. Our fandom is, is, is circular now. So I rounded them up. I said, let me show you something. And I sat them on my lap and I put it on and we watched it together. And my excitement and their excitement kind of just merged. And it was an incredible experience. Just like I hope the Samper is. Where we all walk out of Star Wars The Force Awakens saying, man, that was cool. And the ride home, the car is just filled with everyone talking about Star Wars. And what they liked. And what they looked forward to. And what interested them. The way Star Wars once was back during the original trilogy times when all you talked about was Star Wars and you had your Star Wars toys and your Star Wars vehicles and you had your own Star Wars universe that you created in your imagination and all you talked about was Star Wars and how cool it was. So I did finally watch the trailer. I did give in on it. It is exciting. It does it does hit you in the right spots. Get you in those moments where you're like, oh man. Can't wait to see this. I hope it's so good. And that's the key, man. That's the key. That's what we want Star Wars to be. That's what we hope Star Wars is. We can't project what we what we uh, desire it to be, the story that we hope it is, where we hope these characters go. It's not our job to write it. Somebody else already has that job. So let them do it. And we'll sit back and enjoy it. <coughs> And by that same token, you know, he, here's here's one of the problems that I've now seen. Because even the poster came out. The poster came out the night before. before. The poster came out Sunday night. Very Drew Struzan uh, styled. Of course, he's retired, so he hasn't done it. A little bit more Photoshop. But it's trying to be done in a way, stylistically, that's consistent with all the other posters. Or the revised posters that came along later. Uh that have been released for all six films to this point. And between the poster and then the trailer, if you go online, what you find is this over-analysis of what's happening. An over-analysis of 
what is in the post or who is in the post or who's not in the post or what does this all mean? What does this say about the film? What does this say about the story we're going to be told? And the same thing is done for the trailer. What does this shot mean? What about the way that this person is looking? Or the body language? And it's trying to predict or project what these things mean when really we don't know shit. We don't know a goddamn thing about this movie. And here we are trying to say, well, I, I, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And look, fan theory is fine to an extent. But when you get to this particular level, where you're trying to figure out two months in advance what it all means, how can that possibly set you up for any sort of legitimate enjoyment of what you're going to get in December? How does this line you up as a fan to just watch a movie. And I'm not saying you shouldn't think about the movie. I'm just saying there are problems where if you think too much, your own head is going to get in the way of your enjoyment. So stop overanalyzing everything that's happening in the poster. Stop overanalyzing everything that's happening in the trailer. Stop overanalyzing everything you're going to see in the TV spots. Stop overanalyzing every little tidbit that you're going to get along the way. Because you're sucking the fun out of Star Wars, man. Again. This is what happened with the prequels. Look, I was there. I remember the Phantom Menace coming along. I remember people just pouring over every little thing, every little detail, before they'd seen the movie. And it just, it takes the fun out of it. It's okay to just watch something as entertainment and letting it entertain you. There will be plenty of things in Star Wars to talk about. There will be plenty of things in Star Wars to discuss. There will be plenty of things in Star Wars to debate about and converse about. But the time and place for that isn't two months before we've seen the movie. The time and place for that is after we've seen the movie. After we figured out what J.J. Abrams is trying to tell us story-wise. And once we actually are able to figure out whether or not we like it. So, just proceed with caution. Because we've been down this road before. And it didn't end well. So maybe change the tactics just a little bit. Change your approach just a little bit. And maybe when December comes, you'll feel a little bit more satisfied. Just maybe. Just maybe. Alright, another cool thing that's going on this week is uh, the future is now. The future is now the present. Back to the Future Day has arrived in fact, as I record this right now, it is Back to the Future Day. And oddly enough, uh, it is 121 at this very moment. Coincidentally. So those 1.21 gigawatts have figured out a way to make their way into this podcast. But it is October 21st, 2015, which is the day in the future that Marty McFly arrives... And this is a day that has been many, many years in the making. A 
a day that kind of makes me feel old. But that's all right. It's a cool day. It's a day <clears throat> that as a Back to the Future fan, this is this is where the fandom is kind of cool. This is where the fandom can be a good thing. Where we can all kind of come together as people who love something. In this case, the Back to the Future trilogy. More specifically, Back to the Future Part 2. And we can celebrate it. We can say, man, wasn't that awesome? I think so. Let's talk about it. Let's just geek out about it. Let's just shower it with love. And that's the right way to go about it. And there are cool things along the way. There's rumors that we might get uh, Nike Air Mags. Pepsi put out collector's edition Pepsi Perfect bottles. Not to brag, I did manage to score one this morning. But by the same token, this is where fandom can also run into some problems. The Pepsi Perfect release was 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 a mess, kind of a debacle. Because at about 11:30 the night before on the 20th, not even future day. Both Walmart.com and Amazon.com, which were the two outlets that were going to be selling the Pepsi Perfect Collectors Edition, put the thing out early and unannounced. And they were bought up by fandom scalpers or whatever we want to call them. And of course, thrown up on eBay for exorbitant amounts of money. And really, uh, who the hell wants to pay $3,000 for a Pepsi? People don't even like paying $1.50 for a Pepsi, especially knowing that Coke is like right next to it. But I get it. This is a cool thing. People wanted a part of it. And you know, people lost their shit. And they took to social media. They took to Amazon. And they just complain about it. And bash Pepsi. And just kind of talk shit about how what a, what a horrible thing this is. And I get it. There were only like 6,500 limited edition bottles made. People love Back to the Future so much, they wanted a piece of this. But sometimes you also just got to let it go. Sometimes you have to behave rationally and say, eh, I wanted the thing, but now it's, it's just not worth it. We're not owed anything just because we're fans. And in the case of the scalpers, the reason that they are able to act in that way is because fans are then feeding into the bullshit. Because we have FOMO. We have this thing where, oh, I need the thing. I can't miss out on the thing. I have to have the thing. Even though... It went from me spending $20 to get it to now 3000 For a, a, a thing that's going to probably sit on your desk and collect dust? Yeah, it's cool to have, but at what point does it become not so cool to have? At what point does what you have to do to get it now make the thing less cool than it once was. At what point do you say, nah, that's my line and I'm not going to cross it? Because too often it feels like geeks are willing to draw the line and then when faced with the line, just say, ah, fuck the line. I, I, I got, I got, it's on the other side, I can see it! We feel so entitled to everything that then we behave irrationally when it comes to trying to get the thing that we wanted. 
We will act to no end. There is nothing that can possibly stop us once we set our mind on having the thing. I'm guilty of it too sometimes. I'm not trying to say like I'm above this. There are times where I'm just like, ah, I gotta have this thing and then I go and I get the thing. And maybe later down the line, I'm like, ah, I should have behaved differently, but it's too late now. In retrospect, I, I probably should have kept my head. But we see it all the time. So twice this week, once here with Pepsi Perfect. And then the other part was with the, the ticket pre-sale for those first Star Wars The Force Awakens screenings. Where people were going nuts. They were crashing systems. Fandango went down. MovieTickets.com went down. Alamo Draft House went down. Everybody was going down because there was just this flood of people pouring into getting their tickets in such a rabid fashion like as if there was no more as if it was water and we were living in some steampunk society as this was this was a, a post apocalyptic landscape and we needed our hands on gasoline or food And I watched the madness take place. In the very next afternoon, I was able to pop online quietly without a problem. And actually just see tickets. For the first show in IMAX 3D. And I could have gotten them right then and there if I wanted to. Without a problem. The problem right now is that geeks have fed into the hype so much at times that now we've allowed ourselves to be taken advantage of when the opportunity arises. And we can't say no. We're so fanatic about it that we just can't let the thing escape. We can't let the thing go beyond our reach. We gotta have it now. We need it. And we will do... We will stop at nothing to have it. Somebody was, I think, on eBay... Trying to sell first screening tickets for Star Wars The Force Awakens for like 10 grand. And the sad part is, I'm sure that someone, someone, somewhere, at some point, looked at that and said, ah, maybe. And went into their bank account and started counting up their pennies and figuring out if it was manageable. And why? It's not like there's not another Star Wars playing in about two and a half hours after that. It's not like they're not going to be showing round the clock that entire opening weekend. It's not like anybody's going to be seeing anything else through the holiday season. It's not Star Wars The Force Awakens. Okay, maybe The Hateful Eight. But there's going to mostly be Star Wars. So to go to that level, to, to have people say, hey, three grand for a bottle of Pepsi, and you go, ah, maybe. Hey, ten grand for tickets to see Star Wars The Force Awakens. Nah, maybe. This is why these situations happen. Because we put ourselves in our in these situations, and other people go, ah, fuck it. Let's take advantage of it. And they do. This is the free market system at work. Them creating a demand for something that we need to have. Because we bought into the hype. We bought into the bullshit. Star Wars is a, a cool thing. 
but let's behave rationally about it. Back to the Future is a cool thing, but let's behave rationally about it. Because when we behave irrationally, when we are maniacs about it, no good comes from that, only bad. And with that bad comes a repetition of other people trying to once again take advantage of our fandom because we can't stop. We can't help ourselves. And they are more than happy to help us right down that path where it happens again and again and again. So just, just cool out. You'll be better for it in the long run. And you might actually thank me for trying to help talk you off the ledge. I'm getting up on the ledge right now, though. This is my time to get up on the ledge. And no one's going to talk me off it. And some of you may even join me. This is the time for me now that I've talked you off the ledge with Back to the Futures and Star Wars to talk you right back up on the ledge. With the new developments we're hearing with the future of the Die Hard franchise. I love Die Hard. I love John McClane. Die Hard for me, bar none, is probably, no not probably, easily, my favorite action movie of all time. I can watch Die Hard anytime it's on. I can put Die Hard on anytime I'm feeling down. Die Hard is one of those go-to movies for me. It's one of my must-see Christmas movies. Die Hard for me, I love this movie. It's so great. And then as you move through the rest of the franchise, eh, not so great. Die Hard 2 I like. I like Die Hard 2 Die Harder. I do. I like it. Probably because it's the same exact movie as the first one. And what's wrong with that? I don't have too much of a problem with that. I'm okay with that. Just watching almost the same movie, but a little bit different, but mostly the same. It's comforting. I, I like the comfort of that. Die Hard 2, I'm fine with. It's now when we start to get into Die Hard 3, Die Hard with a Vengeance, eh, that's where I'm not so uh, in tune. Just a, just a strange film. I mean, I like the idea of Jeremy Irons being Hans Gruber's brother, and I like that aspect of it. But you put it in New York City, around the city, it's during the day, which kind of feels odd. The rest of the New York Police Department kind of feel buffoonish. Now you start giving John McClane a, a teammate, a partner, a sidekick, which, granted, has something on a much smaller degree in the first two films. The first film, he still has uh, Carl Winslow. <laughs> but he's also not there with him. He's not in the action with him. He's outside. He's talking to him. Just somebody to bounce ideas with. Someone to, someone to keep him in, in check. And then you get to Die Hard 2, and he's got the little, that little short guy from up in the tower who's helping him. And even then, he's not really engaging. He's just helping him with other information. Hey, what about this? Hey, there's this over there. He knows the lay of the land, and he's helping somebody who might be able to help the situation. But he's not an equal. 
Die Hard 3 with a vengeance, all of a sudden start people will start saying, uh, John McClane can't do this alone. And uh, look, I understand getting to the point where how much is too much of John McClane being involved in these shitty situations? How many times can something like this happen to one guy in a lifetime? Wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's the premise for Die Hard 1. It's ultimately the premise for Die Hard 2. Die Hard 3 starts coming at him. But once again, like... How many times can these extraordinary circumstances happen to this ordinary guy? So Die Hard with a Vengeance starts for me to take that dip once you start bringing in Samuel Jackson and Zeus. I, I'm, I'm not a fan. Live Free and Die Hard. Or Die Hard. It's just, it's like a generic action film. It wouldn't be bad if it wasn't called Die Hard. If it was just called something else. You'd be like, nah, it's a... Generic Bruce Willis action movie. Instead, you start getting into the situations where John McClane just it doesn't feel real in in the Die Hard world. And the other one, which I don't, I don't, even, I can't even remember its name. That's how that's how much I've expunged it from the record in my mind. Same thing. You know, you had Justin Long in Live Free Die Hard. This one, you have Jai Courtney as his, as his kid. Or all of a sudden, John McClane's like a Superman. It's ridiculous. The movie's just gotten worse. No one saw the last one. Who's one, which once again, whose name I can't remember, and I don't even care to look it up. It's Die Hard 5. Should have been dead. That's what, it's, that's what it's called. Like, the thing, the series should have been long over by then, but they keep they kept doing well enough, and Bruce Willis would kept, kept coming back to them, so they're like, yeah, why not? Let's just keep doing them. So now, there's a plan over at Fox to make a Die Hard 6. With Len Weissman, who directed Live Free or Die Hard, coming back... And this would be a prequel of sorts that we that would still figure out a way to get Bruce Willis back in, bookending it, probably just, you know, telling the story of his younger self. And the idea is for it to take place in 1979, taking John McClane back to being a regular cop in New York City, and the idea is to, quote, show how he became a diehard kind of guy. So an origin story for John McClane to show how John McClane became John McClane. The problem with that is that that's Die Hard. Die Hard shows how John McClane became John McClane. That's the movie that did that. John McClane was a cop who had separated from his wife comes out to maybe try and fix his marriage, is most certainly still an asshole. That's why this separation happened to begin with, but shows no signs of not of hiding his asshole niche. And then when all this shit goes down with Hans Gruber inside Nakatomi Tower... This ordinary New York City police officer rises to the occasion and becomes extraordinary. Wrong guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Who elevates himself to being the hero the moment needs. That's how he became a diehard sort of guy. Not with some bullshit that happened back in 1979. And look, there was a comic book prequel. 2010, there was a comic book prequel, I believe, called Die Hard Year One, which is what they're hoping to call this now. Except they're not they're probably not gonna take it. Take everything from there. They're gonna try and ratchet it up and show Bruce Willis and John McClane as being this badass.
But Boom Studios had one that had showed John McClane is a rookie cop, much more street level, a little bit more subtle. And that dealt with John McClane working the 1976 bicentennial celebration. And just, just kind of showed the beginnings of the character. Didn't take him to John McClane levels. It was, it's okay. It's not die hard. It's okay. But taking any of this premise and putting it on, on the big screen for a movie just sounds ridiculous and awful. Nobody wanted to see Live Free or Die Hard. Nobody wanted to see the last one, which I still don't even remember the name of. For good reason. Die Hard should have died hard a long time ago. Because it's just not good anymore. It's John, it's Bruce Willis turning John McClane into something that John McClane was never supposed to be. And something that nobody wants to see John McClane as. Nobody wants to see the character in that way, in that shape. Or that form? Would it be a rugged, smart ass who's probably overmatched by the task in front of him? But he's so savvy, he's so street smart, that he'll, he'll still figure out a way to get up on you because he's a. He's an asshole. He refuses to lose. He can't... He can't... He has to win almost... Not even to have victory, but out of spite. Because he can't stand you winning. He doesn't need to win. He just can't stand you winning. Die Hard is the origin story of John McLean. There doesn't need to be a Die Hard year one. Maybe just let Die Hard go away. This is coming as a longtime fan. There doesn't need to be another Die Hard. There doesn't need to be a Die Hard prequel. There doesn't need to be a Die Hard origin story. There doesn't need to be another Die Hard. Let it die hard. Because that last movie put a big bullet right in its head. Alright, let me go back to Irrational Fandom just for a moment. As if I didn't just escape there with my diehard fandom. Uh, there were some rumors going around earlier this week concerning the Fantastic Four. Uh, there have been uh, negotiations and talks uh, in recent months... Uh, between Fox and Marvel uh, on the idea of doing uh, an X-Men television series. So, over at FX, they're developing Legion, and over at Fox, they're developing Hellfire. And the rumor that was spreading like wildfire was that Marvel would be getting back the rights to the Fantastic Four from Fox in return for granting them the TV rights to make something with the X-Men, expanding the X-Men universe into television. Of course, uh, it was all bullshit, but that didn't stop uh, fans from needing to feed the narrative that they so desperately want to be true. Which is the Fantastic Four leaving Fox and being welcomed back into the Marvel Cin Cinematic Universe with open arms and incorporating that in Phase 3 and 4 and 5 and whatever else. Look, this isn't Spider-Man. I realize that Spider-Man happened and it was the right circumstances at the right time that helped make that happen. A lot of turmoil, a lot of upheaval at Sony... The two amazing Spider-Man films that didn't really change the world. 
and kind of an idea over there, like, oh, let's let's take a look at some things. And even then, once again, Marvel doesn't own Spider-Man. Sony still owns Spider-Man. They have just come up with a partnership to allow Spider-Man to now exist in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for Marvel to help creatively direct and produce the films that once Spider-Man goes solo will still be under the Sony umbrella. That doesn't mean that that's all going to happen for the Fantastic Four. I realize we've had three Fantastic Four films over at Fox. Fantastic Four, which wasn't very good. Rise of the Silver Surfer, which was really, really very not very good. And then the Josh Trank reboot, which is better than people give it credit for, but still also not very good. But people want to go down this rabbit hole. They want to have this pipe dream that somehow, some way, Fox is just going to hand over the rights to the Fantastic Four, to the, the creative people at Marvel. Just let them have it. So that they could turn it around and make it great for all the fans and Fox gets nothing for it. And it's not going to happen. I will never say never, but it, it's pretty close to never that Fox will give that up. They have their own ideas of creating their own extended universe. Sharing something together with the X-Men, which they have worked to do something special with, to make a bigger thing. They still have designs on somehow repairing the Fantastic Four with a sequel following Josh Trank's film from earlier this year. They're not going to reboot it again. They have to still try and develop something in order to keep it the rights from reverting. But they're not just going to hand it over and say, Nah, fuck it, we can't do anything with it. Here you go. It's not going to happen. So just let it let it go. I realize how desperately you want it to happen and that's why rumors like this get embraced, but just look at it and think of it and see if it just passes the sniff test. Just take a good whiff. And no matter how desperately you want it to be true, if it smells like bullshit, it probably is. And in this case, it was. And shame on some of you for holding on to it and spreading it around as if it was really going down. It's not... It doesn't look like it will anytime soon. Just hope that Fox can get it right. Got the X-Men right. Had two solid X-Men films. Then they took a detour into Shit City. Between X-Men The Last Stand and X-Men Origins Wolverine... And uh, I kind of figured out a, a way back with X-Men First Class and moving forward. They've shown the capacity to be able to right the ship. Let's hope they could do that with the Fantastic Four. Because they're not just going to give it away. One other quick tidbit before I get into this week's Just the Worst. Uh, Godzilla vs. King Kong has now been officially dated and, uh, and is happening. Officially going down. We kind of knew that this was going to happen when uh, Warner Brothers and, and Legendary got back together again. And now it's officially been set for 20, 
19, no, 2020, that's right, 2020, sorry. So 2020, Godzilla versus King Kong, that will be preceded by Kong Skull Island, which is going to go down uh, March 2017. Godzilla 2 will come about June 2018, and then an undetermined date in 2020 for Godzilla versus King Kong, bringing together this entire shared universe... Uh, that the Monarch Corporation will be uh, really at the heart of. But this should help create this larger cinematic thing that they want to do that will probably bring about Mothra and Rodan and Ghidorah. So it'll be a huge Godzilla King Kong thing. Uh, Still not sure how they're going to make the size work. Uh, Godzilla in that Godzilla mill and the uh, Godzilla reboot was uh, really fucking humongous. Um, King Kong uh, in the Peter Jackson film, not so much. So they're going to have to either size him up or size Godzilla down in order to make it work. Because right now, I, I just think it, it's it's not going to happen. But Godzilla vs. King Kong, a cool concept. Because like those are the two famous movie monsters that have ever lived. So to stick them in a film, which has been done before, but to stick them now where they're capable of so much more... Action-wise, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, Let's get into this week's Just the Worst before we wrap up the show. Every week, talk about the worst thing, just the worst thing that came across my desk. And that would have to be this week, um, the insistence that Friday the 13th still has to be a thing. There has long been... An idea of once again doing something with Friday the 13th after the reboot didn't really quite work. They had had some writers come in, had some ideas coming in. They were trying to possibly do something found footage. which didn't make much sense because you're literally just watching people run around and not do shit. Whereas every once in a while they capture Jason Voorhees like murdering their friend. So the idea initially was to do something earlier this year. They had something dated for March 13th, 2015. Couldn't get it to work. Pushed the date back to November 13th. Because once again, that would be a Friday the 13th. Wasn't able to get anything together yet. Then they pushed it back again. They were going May the 13th. In case you haven't seen the pattern, they can only release Friday the 13th movies on a Friday the 13th. So they're going to continue to push it back and wedge it in there wherever they possibly can. May 13th, 2016, yeah, that doesn't seem to happen because they still don't have a fucking idea. So now they've pushed it back again to January 13th, 2017. Which at that point will be like eight years almost since the last Friday the 13th reboot. What they hope is long enough for people to have forgotten and jump back in. Except how many new things can you do with Jason unless you want to send him back into space? Which, by the way, entertaining is all hell concept. Probably has, for me, arguably the best kill in a Friday the 13th movie. And it's just so goddamn ridiculous that how could you not have fun watching Jason in space? But now they want to bring new writers in. They want to try and do it all over again. They want to try and re-inject some life into Friday the 13th. Maybe Friday the 13th shouldn't be re-injected with life. Jason came back and came back and came back and lived again and lived again and lived again so many times. They think people just got tired of it. And granted, Jason Voorhees is still one of the iconic horror characters right up there with Leatherface, right up there with Freddy Krueger, right up there with Michael Myers. But that doesn't mean you gotta drive him into the ground. When you don't really have a good idea for making it happen just because he's got the hockey mask and the machete and people still think he's cool. They tried to do that with Nightmare on Elm Street with their reboot. That was a failure. And they're still trying to figure out another way to tap into Freddy and it hasn't worked because it's really tough to come up with something new after like nine and ten chapters that you hadn't done anything like that before to come up with something fresh 
and exciting that you haven't already covered. New Friday the 13th is just the worst idea right now. And until you come up with a really good one, you should just shelve this thing, leave it alone, and maybe in 20 years, that's when you come back to it. Then you can start anew. Right now, it's an uphill climb that really, really doesn't seem like a good idea. In fact, it seems like just the worst one. That's it for the show, man. Ladies and gentlemen, so I appreciate you coming here and checking out Just the Worst Podcast, episode number six. I have been your host, Billy Donnelly, who once again you can find at thisisinfamous.com and joeblow.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at InfamousKid and on Facebook, facebook.com slash BillyTheKid. Find us, Just the Worst Podcast, on Twitter at JTW Podcast as well as on Facebook, facebook.com slash just the worst podcast. Thanks again for listening, making it all the way through, and hopefully finding some perspective on some of the things you've come across this past week. We'll be back next week with another brand new episode. But until then, go out there, check out some good movies, and uh, the future is now. So kind of enjoy that bit of of a mind fuck right there so i'm your host billy donnelly i'm out we'll see you next week peace just the worst podcast episode number six has been a presentation of just the worst podcast